Good afternoon, everybody. It is so great to see you. Welcome to a special edition of Umpire at Home. Aren't they all just special, though? Can I just say that? They are all special. I am so excited about the guests that we have to bring to you today, and he is going to be coming on in just a few minutes. But let's start out as we always do, because it is really important for me to acknowledge and say hi to all of you, because you are what make these live streams so so super awesome and oh boy there's a there's a lot of you here how am I gonna get through this all Rachel you were set up early and I am impressed I am impressed and I'm sure you've got your Merlot yep you got your Merlot out of girl Niels is here as always uh Job good to see you thanks for joining yellow Job is is uh testing out yellow on the trial. If you are interested in doing the same thing, just go to fhu3t.com and check it out. I'm really looking forward to working with Job and getting to know him better and finding out what he is working on his umpiring journey and seeing how we as a community can support him. So I'm very, very excited about that. Andy is here because he's not on a date tonight. Look, I'm just saying he skipped out because he has like other things to do. Simon's here. Hello to all the th her team with my son. Yes, me and my son burnt toes. Uh, status update, um, still red and still a little sore. Yes, sun burnt toes. That's me. Heart mood, it is here. I hope I'm saying that better now. It is great to have you along. Um, don't forget. Yeah, like and subscribe, right? You know my deal. You know my deal. If you've heard me say it before, that means that we're ready. But if you've never, if you if you are new, put new in the comments so we can welcome you along because it is always great to have new people here. And this is a team. This is a community. And we want to welcome you properly the way that we should. Mark Cummings is here from Oxfordshire. Always great. And who sings the waiting song? It's from... So I have a royalty-free audio service 
audio.com with two eyes. And let me see if I can find the actual info. That might be a bit challenging right now, but it's, it is called get ready. I know that much. That's all I know. I just like it. I like the vibe. I do, and now I'm learning all the lyrics and I just want to sing it all the time. So there you go. Let's get it on. Oh, not awkward at all. <laughs> Fresh off the pitch says Andy. So yes, you had stories for us, Andy. That was very entertaining on the back channel. Good to hear. Um, and you're enjoying the, the intro song too? Good. I like it, Nails. Um, Mick. It's, it's okay. I got this. I got this nailed down. Two days in a row live streaming. I'm a professional, folks. Don't try this at home. Simon Jackson's back. Good to see you. I hope you had a good time umpiring last night. And yes, everybody's asking about the song. We'll find out. Okay, I'll find it out for you and put it in the comments. Don't let me forget. And uh, you're looking forward to do good. Good, good, good. <laughs> I did get you in trouble, didn't I, Andy? That's me. Phase and hockey, welcome. You're new. Hi. Great to have you. It's a ridiculously good looking team. You're absolutely right. <laughs> Except it's a tram. I think Martin might be wondering in the green room just exactly what he's gotten himself into, but it's going to be okay. Gary Joy, you're here. Martin and the third team, welcome from a very warm Essex, no Merlot, but a large mug of tea. I approve. Tea is an excellent beverage. I tried drinking through some of my earlier interviews with like Lim and Tomo and Kernsey and stuff. And it was really fun, but I probably wasn't as smart as I could have been. I was a lot better looking though. Oh, Simon's found it. There's the song. Two days in a row, what could possibly go wrong? I love how you guys pick up on all the phrases that I like to use. It's awesome. Simon says his night last night was a good game, no cards and better drink. That fits so perfectly into our guest philosophy. So we're going to talk about that a lot more. Do not microwave your tea. Oh, you're not telling me. I'm not a monster. Okay. Microwave my tea. I French press my tea. I'll have you know. My goodness. That was shocking. The accusations are flying here. So we, I don't have much to introduce and to say because I had lots of announcements yesterday. But before we get going, I just want to send a quick shout out to Chris Maloney. Yesterday, he sent me that last minute question and I told him, okay, I'll, I'll really try to work it into the stream. And I was able to. And he thanked me with Rosé. So I really appreciate this kind of support. And if you would like to do the same thing, you can go to the link and buy me Rosé and get me drunk. Because that's exactly what Chris said. I said, Chris, you can stop buying me rosés. And he says, no, I want to get you drunk. I'm like, okay. I applaud you. I applaud said efforts. And we will have a, uh, as always, a little bit of an after party going on in the Discord channel. Now, we're all just learning about Discord. It looks absolutely effing crazy. I know, but don't be intimidated. Godders came in last night. I, oh, I have to tell you guys. Godders popped into the Discord server yesterday. And he managed to strike up a voice channel conversation with me. And we sat there and we just talked about umpiring for like half an hour. And then he accidentally disconnected himself. But until that moment, it was magic. And I had a great time. So think about popping over, seeing what it's about, because I think this would be an amazing way for us to be able to continue to communicate and just build our team, build our community and be able to talk amongst us because it's awesome. Um, there is the, the full length, but if you want to shorthand it, fhumpires.com slash discord, and there is the link for the buy me a coffee. So thanks very much for <laughs> the mod team for being on top of it. Nick, there are <laughs> 10,000 reasons why God is lawyers. If you weren't there yesterday, that joke isn't funny. But if you were there yesterday, you know that it is. Okay, so everybody, let's get to the main event. I think he stopped turning his camera around <laughs> as I'm watching in the in the side. I'm like, what's happening with Martin? It's like going like this, but this is the magic of live streaming. I'm not flummoxed. I'm fine. I'm ready. Like, 
it's it's all good. So without further ado, please, please give a fantastically warm welcome to Mr. Martin Madden, everybody. See, I even have sound well, effects yeah, for you. Fantastic. I know, right? I, I know. I'm not a monster. Thanks for coming yeah. on, Martin. This is... Sorry, I had to... I had... Uh, I had to plug my phone in. I was going to run out of battery. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> okay, so apparently I need to develop a cheat sheet for all of my guests that has all the steps. Okay, lock your pets outside unless they're very cute and you want to bring them on camera. Lock your kids outside unless they're very cute and you want to bring them on camera. Get your phone all charged up. Get your lights turned on. All those sort of things, and get your beverage. So I'll remember that. I'll remember that, that for next time, but, but you're here and it's cool. And I'm just so glad that you decided that you would take some time out to talk to us because you were, you were telling me when we were doing our little intro conversations that you don't get asked to do very many of these interviews. And so like, why is that? Why, why do you, why do you not get into all these things? Because there's some empires who seem to be everywhere. And then others of you are a little bit quiet. Why are you one of the quiet ones? Uh, I think it's because people don't understand what I'm saying, so they just don't <laughs> ask me. I gotta say, so in preparation for this uh, talk, because I am a serious journalist, I listened to your interview on Af the Backboard, which I know I'm not saying right, but with your fellow Scotsman. No, you're good, you're good with that. That was pretty good, Af the Backboard, and... And uh, it was lovely, uh, but I actually found that you were far more understandable than your interviewer. I didn't know what the hell he was saying sometimes. You started talking about some bar somewhere, and the Scott just came barreling out of him, and I had no clue what was happening. So I'm glad I got you <laughs> to, to talk to me and talk to all the friends yeah. at home about umpire today, for sure. So... So there you go. So Martin, let's start off with you telling everybody at home just a little bit about yourself from a hockey history perspective. I'd, I'd love to hear, and I'd love everybody at home to hear, like how you got started in hockey. Uh, well, I've, I've, I mean, I've been involved in hockey since I was very, very small. My, my dad uh, was always a hockey player. Uh, he went to two Olympics. He went to Seoul and Atlanta uh, as an umpire. Um, so really I was kind of, I was playing hockey all the time down at a uh, local club at Clydesdale. Um, and it just, to be honest, I preferred being outside running around than uh, ever doing any schoolwork. <laughs> That's so fair. It just all kind of went from there. Yeah, absolutely. So your dad, we're not going to talk about him too long because I thought it was quite funny in one of your interviews. You were saying, yeah, he was a decent umpire. Like he wasn't the worst. <laughs> And I thought that was hilarious because your yeah. dad was uh, the first. No, go ahead. You you, you tell the story. Well, I, I mean, I, I still say just now that I'm, I'm still not even the best umpire in my own family. <laughs> um, he, he's he, he really he really kind of kind of set it up in terms of for Scotland for so many guys to come through like Jed Curran, David Leeper, uh, guys who you know really went to the top of their game. Uh, and he he kind of went there first, and there was no Scottish umpire that had, or certainly not for a long time, that had gone to Olympics and and sort of done the level he had done. So you know, for him to to do that, and then he gave so much back to all the other umpires. You know, the the guys that were coming through in terms of his time, his experience, and things like that, and really showed kind of showed everyone that how far you can go. Uh, in terms of hockey, uh, especially from a you know a, a small hockey playing country, um, with kind of limited opportunities uh, internationally, and then be able to kind of step up and onto the, the biggest stages in the world. Yeah. Um, so from that side, he was a. I think he's still seen as a, a bit of a trailblazer in terms of Scottish hockey. Yep, absolutely. Okay, quick story I have to tell you, because I totally forgot about this until last night. My international umpiring career started in 2002 when I was invited to go on tour with Canada over to Scotland. And we went to Wales after that, but we started in Scotland and we headed to Largs, 
which I don't know if a lot of ha- hockey happens in Alarks these days. Who knows? And the ladies played a four-game series against them. And now, if you want to find somebody at that point in their life who knew less about international umpiring than I did, I would seriously pay you a million dollars because it just didn't exist. I had no idea about anything. I didn't even know that there were things like umpire coaches or managers. Like, I really had no idea. So I rock up to the doing these games, and this gentleman shows up and he says, I'm your umpire manager for this series. I'm like, cool. Who are you? Craig Madden was my very first international umpire manager. And I was remember it? him taking us to the pub after the game. And I, I don't even remember who I may have umpired with Letty McKinnon. I, I don't even remember who I umpired with. And he took us over to the pub afterwards, as I believe would be his want. And did the debrief there and, you know, gave me a report after the four games. It was just, I was just, oh, this is so cool and so fancy. And he's drinking a lot of beer. This is awesome. Like, if this is what international umpiring is, I'm all in. So your dad had a big part in sort of the launch of my career, which I think is just so, so cool. So please, the next time you see him, because I don't think he's big on the internet, you know, just... Give him a shout out for me and, mm. and tell him I say hi and a big thank you because I didn't even realize what was happening and how much that positive experience would have a big impact on my career. So there you go. Quick story. We're connected. Yeah, let, We're connected, we, which is amazing. I know. And there was, a, there was a couple comments I thought that I should bring in in particular. Where, where did it go? Um, I think, oh, there it is. David Tommel. Tom will got up early in the morning to come say hi. Can you see that comment there? He did sleep in a bit because it's, I don't know, it's like four o'clock well, he, past. He the... did travel. He did. Uh, he, he did travel halfway around the world to umpire one game with me. <laughs> oh, you were on the other side of that. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing because that is the yeah, game. The, I, that, yeah, the irony of that game is that everything happened at my end. Yeah, I, th- I think it did. And the way he described it, he was just, just counting the minutes down to get to the end of the game because he didn't feel yeah. good. He was jet lagged and, you know, didn't feel very, he was, he wasn't at the right t- time of his season to be like hopping into a pro league game. So he's just, I'm just so glad that Martin was there and taking care of the whole game. So that is super, it, super it awesome. Was an ama- it was an amazing effort. It was a, an absolutely amazing effort from Tomo that time. It was <laughs> absolutely brilliant to see. <laughs> oh yeah. And to, and to be umpiring Spain, who were they playing that day? Do you remember? Uh, Spain, was it Spain, Argentina? Yeah, probably. So you're taking like the two yeah. hardest teams to probably yeah. put together and manage them. And yeah, it was, yeah. A, yeah, it was a bit of a test. <laughs> and a bit testy indeed. That is so awesome. So you you grew up in a, in a lot of sports and you settled into hockey and you did, you did play for some time in, in school and things like that. But like many of us, we kind of discovered that we were better at umpiring than playing. When did that happen for you? I, I mean, it was very, very early on, uh, probably about 15 years old. Uh, and it was, again, it's just, you know, down to the influence of my dad. I was, uh, like I was, I, I was playing a wee bit of sort of representative hockey. Um, but, you know, I knew I was never, never, ever going to make it as a, I didn't have the application as a at that age to mm. to kind of do the training that was needing to be done. So, uh, so so I took up umpiring instead <laughs> because it was a lot less training. <laughs> it, it, it seemed a lot easier. That's fair. That's fair, especially in those times. It just it just wasn't quite as intense. I don't think. So. Um, so you you started umpiring and and you got up to be doing some of the top level domestic stuff pretty quickly, didn't you? Because I, I remember you mentioning on another interview that you were doing um, you were doing your men's prem by the time you were about weren't you only about sixteen or seventeen at that point? Yeah, sixteen to pick me up and take me to games. Yeah. Um, whether it be the other umpire or sometimes the, 
the actual uh, home team would come and pick me up. So I kind of stayed around Glasgow in terms of my games. So yeah. Uh, I, it was a bit strange getting a lift. A lift to, uh, a <laughs> getting a lift team. from the guys that you were about to umpire. How were the rides home? Yeah. Uh, uh, fro- frosty on occasion. <laughs> frosty like the moors in in the middle of winter, indeed. Yeah, I was. I was a, a, a very grudging lift home at times. <laughs> that is awesome. I love that. So when did your first international game happen for you? Because again, you were still really young when that happened. Yeah, I was, uh, my first uh, international would have been, I think it was 17, but it was under 16s, um, there or thereabouts, uh, sort of uh, four nations, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, and France. Yeah. you know, they had quite a lot of these tournaments, certainly once a year. So I, I certainly the first one I did was the under 16 Four Nations and then under 18 Four Nations. So when I was 17 and then 18. So that's amazing. That's yeah, amazing. Pretty early on. Yeah. How did, how did you feel going into those kind of tournaments where you're umpiring players of, of the same age as you? Because you had already been doing adults at home and then you go international and you're umpiring sort of more your peers. Did you kind of appreciate what was happening or was it just kind of like, ah, look, I'm here? No, I just, yeah, I just kind of went out and did, I did the same thing. And, you know, I think even now, I still go out and try and do the same things. I prepare very much the same way. I I treat every game the same way. So it doesn't really matter, you know, if it's a top level game or if it's a club game. I still do the same sort of stuff, uh, regardless of what you know what the game is. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So then, going along your international career, so your first tournament was in two thousand, I believe, and then. You were you were plugging away, plugging away. When do you really think things kind of like? What was your big breakthrough? When did you really pick up momentum and think, okay, I'm actually, I could get to the top of this sport? I don't th- I don't think I've ever actually sat and thought I could get to the top of this sport. I, st- I still I still think that you know. What what do people see in my umpiring that that makes me that much better than the next guy, or you know why why I'm why I'm there? So, uh, but to kind of answer the question, I, th- I think uh, there was a World Cup qualifier in Argentina. Kernzy uh, was there. It was before. Uh, I can't remember when it was now, to be honest. But that was when I kind of first started. Uh, kind of really umpiring well at that level and being, I suppose, being comfortable in the game. And, and at that point, you start thinking, right, okay, I can actually maybe do this. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's when it, that's when I would say I, I kind of really started building, you know, and getting better tournaments and, and sort of higher level sort of stuff. <laughs> that's awesome. Let me bring this one up. <laughs> First up. Thanks for the briefing. The Euros briefing. <laughs> did you have a hand in that or did you deliver it? Or maybe it's because they're having their briefing no, meeting no, right I, now. Is that? <laughs> well, I think I, I blame Marcin Groschel for this. He uh, he was sending around text messages to tell everyone to watch this because they thought it would be amusing for the briefing. Oh, well, you know how I can handle that is I can invite Marcin to come on next. So don't you worry. We well, can. I think he'd love to come. I think he'd love to come on. I, I think he has to come on. I think really is what we're saying here. It's like you know, not even really a choice because well, we have we have done an interview together. Um, well, we were on a. Um, yeah, we're, uh, we're calling him out now. Yeah, yeah. Well, absolutely, we are. He is being put on blast for sure, and. Um, yeah, we've already done an interview together, so we've already got great rapport. So this is super easy, Marson. Yeah. I'll be calling you great um so j- just a reminder all of you that are watching at home make sure you pop your questions and your banter into the comments because i want to make sure that you guys find out the things that you're interested about um martin i have all my curiosities but what do you want to know about the mysterious police constable police sergeant 
Martin Madden. So let's talk about that a little bit. You're, um, it gets br- brought up on the broadcast all the time that you're, um, you're a police officer. How do you oh, think, yeah. <laughs> how do you think your career choice and how you've been spending your time making a living, how does that impact the way that you umpire, d- you know, and, and do, do they, do they really intersect or are you really able to keep things separate? Do you think? Yeah, I'm not sure that I've, I'm not sure my job has changed the way umpire, but mm-hmm. I think it's maybe made me understand a lot more about what I'm doing and why I'm doing it uh, in terms of sort of management and, you know, make it, making your interactions with people count, um, especially kind of in, in sort of pressure situations. So it's not, I don't think it's changed anything. It's, if anything, it's maybe softened me slightly. Uh, I was kind of very, when I was younger, I was quite quite aggressive, quite uh, kind of stony faced. And I know some folk will say that I still look like that, but it's, <laughs> it's certainly not the way I feel. And I think sometimes my, my face comes across as maybe not actually how I feel. Um, so I, it's, do you know what? It's, it has been good for my umpiring, my, uh, the work I do, because it's it gives you appreciation of of so many different aspects of life, mm-hmm. and all of which you can bring into your umpiring. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you can you know different different things you can do, things you can say, how you say things. Uh, so you know you can bring them in at all different occasions, and I think it's been it's been really good from that side. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so w- what I hear you saying is that, you know, being out there and being on the police force and being on the beat and having to deal with people that are often at their at their worst times in their lives has given you a different perspective on, you know, maybe some, some abil- a greater ability to empathize when you're on the pitch with people who are having s- emotional struggles and reacting to tough conflicts and maybe not the most optimal ways yeah. so yeah that's that is really really interesting because a lot of people would assume that you'd go the other way that you're like oh well i'm a i'm on the police force and i'm big and tough and and that sort of thing but it's it's gone the opposite way for you that's really cool yeah and i think that, that i mean ultimately uh, the work you do in the police is very much like the work you do in a hockey pitch it's it's about relationships and interactions uh, at all different at all different times and it changes from game to game from minute to minute depending on the circumstances of the game and the same uh, it's the same for the police you know one minute you're you, you know you're maybe going in really high to something and and then you've you've got to kind of change how you how you then start speaking to people once they've calmed down a wee bit and mm-hmm. and then you know and kind of really de-escalating things down to right we're calm again and everything's okay uh, and I think the same flows with your umpiring because you, you know, you'll, you'll maybe go in with a big penalty corner and then, you know, a minute later you've got a, a tiny wee peep in your whistle and it's, you know, it, it gives you the opportunity to to understand how things flow yeah. uh, and, you know, and really kind of work with it and, yeah. and step in where you need to step in or, or don't if you don't need to. Yeah. Absolutely. I love that. And what's really cool about that is that one of the clips that we have from the game that, um, that you picked out that you wanted to sort of talk about and see some of the clips was that recent match, uh, GB in Germany down at Lee Valley, um, just, just last month. And there's an example of you yeah. doing exactly that with the same player. So I can't wait to get to that because we're going to be able to prove exactly, you know, you doing that same thing. Very cool. Um, Sean has a question here. The umpiring advice that you would give to your 21-year-old self. I mean, you're only 25 now, so it's going to be hard to put yourself in a 21-year-old nah, shoes. But g- give a shot. Give a shot. This is Sean from South Africa. So, yeah, what, what advice would you give to yourself or anybody else who's in 21-year-old shoes here? I would... I, I, I would listen to everything that anyone's got to say about umpiring and I would take take what you what you think is right you know thank everyone for their input you know take what you think's right but try try different stuff 
because there's so many different ways of managing a, pe a person, a situation, a game, uh, and, and try, try everything out to see where it works and where it can fit into your game. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. I, I know for myself going through my umpiring career, I was so anxious to please. And when I, you know, when I was working with an umpire manager, whether it was you know, back in the day, Craig Madden, or, you know, all the different people that we, we tend to work with. And it's, it's different from a player who, you know, players at that level, they usually have a coach for at least four years, maybe eight, maybe even longer. Um, but we've got different coaches, basically, every time we show up at a tournament, most usually. And so we get very different advice and lots of different ideas coming in there. And I tried to do absolutely everything I was told. Absolutely everything. I was like, no, that's correct. No, that's correct. That's correct. And I got so distracted and, and just feeling uncertain about what I was actually doing. And I like what you're saying about, you know, try different things, but figure out what works for you and pay attention to yourself and what works in a situation. And I, I love that advice. That's, um, you know, that's really good. It's a way to stay open to that, but also not just completely go overboard with every piece of feedback that you've got. So that is really cool. Um, a question from Niels here. Martin, do you use the Kun Van Bunga whistles? The whistles in the thumbnail are kind of like it. Do you have a thumbnail where you're... Uh, you're using a particular whistle no no just a nor just a normal thumbnail <laughs> I, I did i do actually use coon's whistle but but only only because he gave me free whistles oh i see so that's the only reason i use them so if i, I shipped you free whistles you'd use my whistles too <laughs> absolutely i like absolutely. it i like that everybody can be bought that's my favorite thing that is so awesome uh, every, everyone has a price <laughs> Yours is usually a beer, but you know, we'll, we'll, we'll go with whistles for a couple things. Yeah. So you, uh, it, so it sounds like to me from what you were saying about your breakthrough, you know, you had your Olympic qualifier, but really 2014 was a big year in your international career because you had, uh, the 2014 world cup, you had Commonwealth games and that sort of set the stage for the biggest appointment of your career to date. Uh, but if you if you have a different one that you wanted to point out, but the Rio Olympics was a big one. How did how did all that sort of feel as it was coming together and getting that appointment for Rio and knowing that you were stepping onto that biggest stage? Because I know you loved your experience at the Olympics. Tell tell us about how wh what made it so special for you. Well. Wait. In the lead up to all that, you know, as you said, that the, the 2014, there was the Commonwealth Games and then the, the World Cup or World Cup, then the Commonwealth Games. And do you know, it was, it was just such a relief when, when I was appointed because you, you sit there and you think, you know, you're looking at all the other guys around the world and you're thinking, right, okay, you know, you know, they could be in and, and, and everyone keeps saying to you, oh yeah, you'll definitely go, you'll definitely go. But until you actually get that letter or that email, uh, you still don't think that, you know, that it's going to happen. Uh, I, I feel really sorry for the folk uh, this year mm -hmm. um, who, who had that kind of letter and then, you know, it, it's not worked out yet and it's, you know, having to wait another year, but, you know, circumstances are what they are. Uh, but I think, you know, you don't, I don't think, I, I certainly never appreciated just how big the Olympics were until you start getting into the last couple of weeks before you go and then getting there. And, you know, I'd been to multi-sport events before. I'd been to two Commonwealth Games. Right. And, you know, you know but the Olympics is just, it's just another level. It really is just everything about it. Uh, and then you go there and you're, you're with the same guys that you, you, you know, you've, you've been umpiring with for the last uh, 10 years and it's so it's like a wee home away from home but sort of yeah. something just totally different absolutely yeah, yeah. is amazing. that the most special part of it is that you're able to share that experience with people that you've gone through so much with and you've you've been to, you know growing up with essentially for a decade yeah 
I, I, th I think it is, uh, well, certainly for me personally, uh, if you if you were to ask me about, and we probably kind of touched on this last week when we chatted, if you were to ask me about specific games that I umpired, you know, at, at the World Cup, I, I, I would probably struggle to tell you what they were. I would, I'd probably struggle to tell you what all my, um, you know, appointments were. But if you asked me about that night where we sat and we, we just chilled out and had a laugh and we talked a bit about hockey, I, I would remember that far more readily. And that's maybe not the it's maybe not the right thing to say, but but that's what that's what you get and that's what you remember from tournaments is the the, the time you spent with folk and yeah, you know, the hockey's great and it's great to be involved in, but you know, you you think about the, the time where you come off the pitch and you relax and you've done a good job because ultimately you're there to do a job. Mm -hmm. um, all kind of joking aside with everything else, it's you, you're expected to perform and there's a lot of pressure on you to perform. Um, so when you do do that and you can come off and you can relax and you have a chat, I think I think that's the best times. Yeah. And, you know, the times where you you know, you support other folk and, and you help maybe other people to get through tough times and things like that, that, that to me is important. Yeah. Uh, or, or I think that's the most important thing. Absolutely. So we're still at Rio and you're having this amazing tournament and two big things happened for you. Not only did you achieve your golden whistle, which hopefully you can see here on the screen, you're posing very yeah. prettily with the the, what was that? What what kind of animal was that? The stuffed animal that they gave you there? I, I, I'm not actually too sure. Um, <laughs> some sort of bear. Some sort of bear or something. So Did you bring it home and give it to your kids? To be honest, <laughs> yes, it's up this. It's upstairs somewhere. <laughs> Oh, that's absolutely. So how did it feel? I, I couldn't remember exactly which match it was that you you actually got your golden whistle. Was it the bronze medal match or did it happen before that? Nope, and I couldn't. And to be honest, I'm struggling to remember who the game was, but I umpired it with Murray Grime and Marson was the reserve. Oh, yeah. Um, so India, Netherlands springs to mind or India, Germany. Um, but you know, I, I, again, it's you know, you'd think it's a, a, a such a big thing, but I actually remember who umpired with yes more readily than than yeah. the, what the who was playing. So yeah, no, I think that um, I think that's amazing. No, and no, I, it, was, it was good. Yeah, and I, I think a lot of umpires would feel the same way that even though we some of us are very obsessive and very analytical, and we get really caught up in our performance stuff, it's not really about what exactly happened on the pitch. It's the experience of what we learned, the mistakes we made, the things we did great, what we took from that, and then who we shared all that with. And you share that with your team members. So even for me, I'm the complete opposite of the spectrum from you in terms of umpiring personality, I think, because, um, you know, we're, we're going to talk about this a little more about how you're, you're, you're pretty laid back about all these things. And obviously I'm, I'm the analyst and that that's, that's my thing. But yeah, I don't remember my games either. I don't remember my games. I remember everybody else's games because I've been analyzing them, but the things that you do there, it's, it's, yeah, it's what you've learned and then who you get to share that with and who's been a part of that journey with you. So yeah, yeah I, I totally love that. So You've been going along for the next couple of years. You had the Hockey World League Finals in 2017, 2018 World Cup. What was that experience like being in Bhubaneswar? Because, I mean, it's the legendary home of, of uh, hockey, you know, worldwide. I mean, we can talk about, you know, the Netherlands and, and other places, but really when you go to India, it's got to be a totally different world. What, what was that tournament like? Uh, the, the tournament itself, I mean, it was World Cups are always really, really good. Uh, I was, I've been fortunate to have the two World Cups that I've been to. One was in India, and one was in the Netherlands, uh, in a football stadium. And you, and you can't really ask for much more than than that in a career. Um, India itself, I, I love going to India. Absolutely love it. Uh, must have been about seven or eight times. And I oh, know wow. it's maybe not for everyone. Uh, yep. it's, I think you need to be a kind of uh, 
a certain type of person to enjoy India on, you know, to go numerous times. Uh, and I went, I went to the Hockey India League. So that was six weeks we were out there. And I loved every minute of it. It was, it was brilliant. So going to India is, is just, it's always been a joy for me. I always yeah. thoroughly enjoyed it. And then yeah. to get to get to umpire in India at a World Cup uh, was absolutely brilliant. It was, the stadium was great. The people are brilliant. You know, you, you can but you can walk down the street and people are actually asking for your autograph. You know, the, you, they know you're one of the umpires and that, you know, and it's just fabulous to see how much they, they love the game. Yeah. Yeah. So I, yeah, a brilliant, another brilliant experience. Yeah. yeah no problems again, with the, the food. Yeah, a lot of guys that I'm good friends with. Yeah. And you had no oh, problems with the food. You were good. Absolutely. Probably. No, absolutely love it. <laughs> I know that if that, if I ever get a chance to go there, I, I didn't in my umpiring career, the Indian women weren't big, uh, big hosts of tournaments when I was umpiring. Hopefully that's going to change for them. I hope that they, you know, ascend those ranks, but, um, may, I might, I might get another chance, but I might regret that because I know that even when I try to eat Indian food at home, it's not a pretty picture. So I'm, <laughs> I'm going to be eating white rice and then bread for, you know, however many weeks I'm there, but, uh, yeah, you're, you're lucky for that for sure. Yeah. There you go. So we've talked a lot yeah. about sort of the big tournaments that you've had. And of course we've got, you know, you've got Tokyo coming up very, very soon. And so we're going to big segment about that. But I was wondering if there were any sort of surprise tournaments along your career that maybe you wouldn't expect. I mean, I obviously hit big highlights, but were there any like small tournaments that you were like, this was just the best experience. And I absolutely love this that you want to tell us about. Yeah. Kind of, uh, well, I suppose there's maybe a, a there's a whole raft of tournaments in, in Europe that are you know, sort of club championships in Eastern Europe and Croatia and you know Vienna and things like that. And they they're some of the best tournaments. I'd be, I would I would be struggling to pick one particular tournament, mm -hmm. uh, but they were they were some of the best tournaments you would ever go to. You know you were treated so well. The hockey was mm, variable, <laughs> shall we say. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, there was lots of, lots of good wee tournaments. The, I think I went to the, the Alps cup, uh, and that was France, Switzerland, Croatia, and someone else. I can't remember who that was, but, oh. um, that, that was a great, that was a great trip. I mean, I was swimming in the fountain outside the hotel. It was, you know, it was just, it was just great fun. Yeah, it was good. <laughs> Uh, good teams, good umpires, managers, yeah. you know, good umpires and things like that. So, uh, and I, th I suppose one other really, really good one was the first time I went to Japan for the Olympic qualifiers before London. Oh yeah. Uh, and I think that, that, that was probably one of the funniest tournaments I've ever been to, um, with a really, really good group of umpires. Yeah. Um, and uh, are there any the stories that you're able to share yeah, from it was, that? It was, or it was good. <laughs> hey, well, there was a Dave, Dave Gentles was there, and um, we we met, we managed to find a, a small bar when our, when it was our days off because we had a couple of days off, and it was it was strange because it, it just looked like someone's house. But it ended up it was a a restaurant come bar, mm -hmm. and we decided oh we went in and had a couple of drinks and some uh, some food. We thought oh, this place is quite good, but uh, Jed Curran introduced uh, Dave Gentles as 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 the great Dave Gentles, who <laughs> you know the umpired Olympic finals and they managed to get pictures of him, and the, the I mean the the bar staff and the the people that worked there and the locals had absolutely no idea what we were talking about but they just absolutely loved it and he was treated like a hero and, and every time he went in you know that was it you know he was he was the great he was getting introduced to everybody oh my gosh uh, and on the last night after all the after all the games had finished we 
we we decided we would have our sort of last night in in this B place, and they put on like a whole load of food for us. They had drinks. There was uh, snake sake, which uh, was sake in a bottle with an actual snake inside it. What? Uh, so we had a couple of those as well. Uh, I, that was a that was a that was a good tournament. Oh my goodness, that sounds like absolute chaos. I didn't know that was a thing, snake sake. I know about worms and tequila bottles, but man, snake sake, good yeah. to know. Someday, maybe I'll try it, or maybe I won't. Who knows? That is amazing. <laughs> so we're, how many days away is it? Is it 50? 50 days away, something like that. I wait for Annalise Rostron to post on social media because she's literally like, she's the clock. She's the clock for you guys. It's like yeah, absolutely. One year, yeah, eight months and seventeen days. <laughs> she's just she's just got the graphics going. Yeah. But there you go. I th- I think you're fifty days yeah. out. Is it? Does that sound about right to you? More or less. Uh, if Annalise is correct, if Annalise is correct <laughs> with fifty days, because that's what I thought today as well. There you go. That's that's perfect. So you're fifty days out. But like everybody else in the world, and, and I know it's like, oh, we're going to talk about the pandemic again. But I think it's it's helpful for umpires at home to hear how the shutdowns, plural, um, may have affected you in your preparation and what you've been doing to get yourself ready. Because one of the things is, is that we are on the eve of the Euros and you were supposed to be there and you're not going. So... Tell me about how the shutdown affected you in the last 15 months and all of this and how you're mentally gearing yourself up to go to Tokyo. Yeah, it's, it's kind of, I mean, it's been strange when when we, when Tokyo was uh, first called off. I suppose it's that you think, you know, oh, geez, oh, they, you know, they, this must be serious. They're calling off the Olympics. And I suppose that's when it first kind of dawned on you that, just how serious it was, because at, the, at that point there was very, very few cases in the UK. I think at the time, mm. um, and I suppose the next, the next six months maybe, um, we are waiting to see what's happening. It's it's kind of like a ship without a sail for me, and that if I've got a definite goal. And I know it's, it seems strange to say I didn't have a definite goal because you knew that the Olympics were going to be the next year. But the way everything was going, it kind of looked like nothing was ever going to be happening. So, yeah, yeah it was it was a it was a time where you start thinking, right, okay, what you know, it's hard to it's hard to motivate yourself for something that you think might happen, it might not happen. Yeah. And I suppose it's only the last. You know, a couple of months that I've really thought, really started thinking, no, I need to get my head in this. And and, and for me, I, I, I don't do huge amounts of preparation as you might have, as you might have picked up, um, because I think I think I've always seen people over prepare and that you know they watch a lot of hockey and they, you know, by the time they actually get to something, it's you know, they're absolutely shattered by the time, you know, of sort of looking at him. So I like to, you know, kind of get everything in order. And then the last sort of few weeks is where mentally I start thinking, right, okay, what am I, what am I thinking about? Where am I going with stuff? So, you know, we're now getting to that period for me where mentally, yes, I've been doing bits and pieces, but not nothing nothing specific and nothing kind of targeted it's all been just kind of as i've gone along yeah. but sort of from now on you start kind of building up a wee bit with, with your actual preparation um, yeah. because i just think too much is there's so many other things going on in life you know and how, how do you how do you concentrate and have quality is better than quantity uh, i think would be the best way of saying it is just to say right okay i need to build to a specific point I know how it works for me. For other people, it's obviously different as well, and you know they need to analyze everything to yeah um, to go in. And I, I'm very much a case of well, we'll, we'll 
We'll see how it goes. <laughs> I love that. You're, you're just so casual. Like, yeah, we'll just see how it goes. So over the last 15 months, did you have any hockey going on at all domestically? Or was it just there's been nothing? Or have you had like little pockets where you've had some matches here, matches there domestically? No, there's been absolutely nothing. nothing. Oh, man. Absolutely nothing domestically. Right. Yeah. So you got appointed to the first set of pro league matches last year in September when there was a, a little bit of a reprieve going on and you went over to, um, was it Germany? And it was Germany, Belgium, I think. Yeah, Germany, yeah. Belgium. With Marson, obviously. Yeah. And so how did it feel stepping yes. on the pitch? Uh, <laughs> yes. How did it feel stepping on the pitch having not umpired for at that point, it would have been at least, it would have been six months um, and not having any of the yeah. domestic competition that you would have usually had or any other kind of prep. How did you feel going into that experience? Or was it just sort of like, yep, business as usual for you? Yeah, certainly in my mind, it was business as usual. I, just with the, the way kind of the international calendar falls a lot of the time and, you know, Scotland not, well, me, me umpiring the sort of top level in Europe and the world and Scotland not being top level in Europe and the world, uh, their preparation is frequently very different from mine. So I don't usually get much of a warm up for uh, for a lot of tournaments. So I'm, I'm kind of used to getting in a wee bit, a wee bit colder than some folk would. Yeah. But you know, I, I seem to, I've always seemed to pick up the pace of, of things fairly quickly. Um, so I, for me, it wasn't quite as bad. Uh, I think there's other folk who really need to build into, uh, you know, to have a real running start at, at tournaments. But I, I've always found that, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good, you know, for, with more limited warm ups than others. Yeah, it's it's almost like that's been the training in your career that because that's that's the standard that you're like, well, this is this is the way that I have to be, and I know I have to prioritize that. And I mean, I've I I was sort of yeah. the same way for years coming from Canada. I mean, most of the time I was in the wrong weather pattern, and I would get an appointment to a mm -hmm. tournament, yeah. say in Argentina in January, where it was thirty three degrees above, and I would fly in from minus 30 and having done indoor for the last four months and then <laughs> popping yeah. over and boom, they're full fledged into their outdoor season and yeah, top nations and feeling really lost. So yeah, it took, it yeah. took me a while to sort of figure that out because you get, I think we, we, we get told and our expectation is, Oh, well we need to warm up. We need to be, getting all this practice in and ease in and things like that. But if that's not available to you, it's just, okay, how do I, how do I remove that expectation from me that that's what I need and just be able to go in and go, yep, I can do this job. So, so I, I, I love that perspective. And it's so, it's so hard. Yeah. But it's so hard. It, 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 it's always going to be so hard for me to replicate, you know, anything in Scotland compared to, to then going straight to do the European A division. Yeah. You know, because the, the, the standard of hockey is, is just different. Um, and so I've, all, I've always had to step up anyway. Yeah. So it's, it's just maybe made it slightly, slightly easier to come from a sort of colder start yeah. than, than it does for us. But then like, so the same with yourself and, and, you know, other, you know, other really good umpires around the world who, who are in the same position. They just they can't replicate the quality, but we don't we don't we can't all go and umpire in the Netherlands right up until you know game time. Um, yeah. So you know you're, you're struggling to replicate it anyway. Yeah. Did you did you ever seek out opportunities to get yourself some you know some different experiences outside of Scotland that mm. weren't in the international setting? Like did you uh, I don't know? Did you pop down to England and do anything there, or pop across to the continent and and spend any time, or did you did you did you get enough opportunities? Do you think on the international stage that your progression was was solid to get you into those big events? Yeah, I, th I think uh, I mean there's there's always been kind of offers, but 
uh, you know, people saying, you know, come over and umpire here and there. But the, the reality of it is that I've got to work. And, you know, you work full time, you've got kids, you've got a wife. Mm -hmm. And, you know, fitting in another weekend where you go to the Netherlands is just simply isn't possible. Yeah. Um, you know, I work, I work three weekends out of five. Um, and, and one of the other weekends that I'm off, my wife's working, so I've got the kids. Right. So, you know, it's, it's, there simply isn't the time. And I do take a lot of time off for hockey. So right. I can't then really in good conscience turn around and say, oh, by the way, I'm, I'm away, I'm buggering off to the Netherlands <laughs> for a, a weekend. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that, was, that came into play for Euros that are starting tomorrow. So you had an appointment to it initially. And um, I think like a lot of the umpires um, who were in contention for that tournament you you waited as long as you could to see what the situation was like, but you you had to step away from it. What went into that decision, and what were the things that you had to take into account before you could say yes or no there? Yeah, so I mean, obviously, I've got I had the time off, um, and we kind of between my my, well, my wife, she's really good at these things. She kind of budgets for her time. She has to take time off to. To work around the kids and school and things like that um but then i mean ultimately it was a fairly easy decision when the when the the uk or scotland in particular are saying no you need to quarantine for 10 more days uh you know it's just it's it's just simply unworkable yeah at the moment so you know as as much as it was a difficult decision it was a relatively easy decision yeah um because you know, there's, there's some things you just can't manage, and there's the, you know it's disappointing, but there's the, there's lots of disappointing things that have happened over the last year, year and a half for for lots of folks. So yeah. if that's the biggest disappointment I've got, then you know I've done not badly at the whole thing. Yeah, so. that's that's very true, and it's not like working from home is an option for you. So <laughs> it wasn't like you could say, I'm no. gonna I'm gonna do my job as a you know, police sergeant from my home office, yeah. you know, although you could know, get cut up on all that paperwork. Like that might've been an option for you, but. Well, but... that's, <laughs> yeah, I know. But, uh, I just... There you go. The paperwork's the dull part. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm sure it is. So, um, in terms of other things that you that you had been doing going into Tokyo, you did get that set of appointments for the GB Germany games uh, last month in May, and that those were the games that we wanted to talk about. and And this is the fun part. So, I was on a podcast with Duncan Ruzik, um, that just got released like about two years, two two weeks ago, and and now I'm like super embarrassed because. Um, we, what we were doing on this podcast is we were picking out a dream team, um, which is kind of weird for umpires to do, but we were picking out like our, you know, our sixes, the, the six, I, I picked a dream team of, of, uh, female players and Duncan picked out his six male players and we made an equal amazing team. And then we picked coaches and we picked umpires. And so of course, when that was sprung on us by Teo McLeod, the podcast host, I said, okay, Duncan, you're picking the women. Cause that, I don't want to be, that's, that's not cool for me. And I'll pick, I'll pick the male umpire. Uh -huh. So Duncan picked Ayanna McLean, uh, which, you know, fantastic choice. And then of course <laughs> I was like thinking, yeah, thinking, and this was before I'd even asked you to come on the show. And I was like, yeah, I think I'm going to have to go with Martin Madden because he walked in to GB Germany, and he knocked it out of the park. And Duncan said, yeah, I was talking to somebody who said, what was up with that Martin Madden guy? And the comment was, he was irritatingly good for somebody who hasn't umpired at all over the last 15 minutes, 15 months. That was just irritating. And I just love that. And it was just, there you go. And and when you and I were talking about picking out which game to sort of, you know, go through some highlights of, you said, yeah, you were really happy with that because, yeah, your your games were great. What what was it, you know, like walking in there, did you feel like, oh, I'm super confident, I'm going to knock this out of the park, but, or were you just sort of going, well, let's just see what happens <laughs> with this kind of chaos? Yeah, uh, very much let's see what happens. <laughs> uh, I think, I think uh, 
given the circumstances, anyone could be forgiven for being a wee bit rusty. Uh, but uh, I, no, I, again, it's kind of back to what I said at the start. It's I don't prepare any differently, mm-hmm. regardless of the game. Um, just because I've not been umpiring doesn't mean I need to do anything different. Um, you know, I, I would I still look at things the same way. My eyes still work most of the time. Yep. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it was just about kind of getting your get, getting your basics. Uh, hoping for a wee bit of luck, which which everybody needs. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, just kind of working with the players, just this, literally the same as you do every other time. And and things will fall for you at times and other things, they'll, you know, they'll fall the other way and it'll look really messy. And, you know, if it looked messy, people would say, well, he's not umpired for 12, year, uh, 12 months or so. Yeah. So, you know, you can kind of understand it. So, but fortunately for me, it kind of, you know, it went reasonably well. So, yeah, it was it was almost a nice opportunity, was it, for for you to just to to get in there and just you know, yeah, throw it in, which is awesome. Before we start going into the clips, because I do have some clips that we're gonna walk through and um, talk about in a way that is gonna make you deeply uncomfortable because you don't analyze matches. So this is gonna be totally out of your comfort zone. I absolutely <laughs> love this. Um, Nick just had a question for you. Who is your hockey hero and why? For him, it was Chris Todd, who is a um, longtime umpire and umpire manager uh, who is no longer with us from England. But who's who's sort of your hockey hero? Uh, see, before I give this, I, I, I'd like to say I, my dad was very good friends with Chris Todd and mm. I knew him pretty well as well. And Nick, you're absolutely right. He was a lovely man, absolutely brilliant guy. Uh, couldn't speak highly enough of him. Uh, my hockey hero, though, um, I don't. Know, I always find these questions really difficult because I don't think I, I wouldn't say I've got an out and out hero. I've got lots of folk that I've taken lots of bits from, and lots of stuff that I have put into my umpiring. Mm-hmm. Um, so, this is going to sound terrible, but I, sp- I really have to say my dad. <laughs> uh, and I don't want anyone to tell him this. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't worry. He's probably not on the internet. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, he's almost definitely not on the internet. But if, if you're talking about the person that's had the most profound effect on my career, you know, for, for hockey umpires, they get an umpire's manager, like like you said, for you know a, a short while. I've had an umpire's manager my entire life. Yeah. And you know, th- there's people that would absolutely kill for that opportunity. And the, the irony is that, you know, you know, we talk about hockey, but we don't talk about, we don't analyze games or or anything like that. But he's, there's always someone there for you to have a conversation with. Yeah. Um. So I, I'm going to have to see him. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. I know that's a, I know that's a boring answer, but... Um, <laughs> Not at all. Uh, Even Nick is, is no, yeah, Nick is chiming I, in saying that's fair dues and that's a very fair answer. I, 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 know, there's, I, know, there's um, I know there's a couple of um, managers out there that will be, be on the... will be texting me shortly saying, why didn't you say me? And I, I think Spikey would probably like to argue that he <laughs> he's had the greatest influence on my life, but... Don't, don't believe him. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> oh, Spikey, that's Henrik Ellers from Denmark, for those of you at home who may not be familiar with uh, with his nickname. But no, I totally understand what you're saying because it is very much a community exercise and our team is very much, you know, you, you're, you're not, especially when you get to that international level, you're not a self, you're not a contained unit that you get to see all the time. It's a very big experience and you're lucky if you get to see like the way that you have you've 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 bonded with a group of of guys that you get to see at many tournaments but when you're maybe somebody like me who didn't quite get to that level and the 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 vast array of people that I worked with over the 16 years from fellow umpires to umpire managers it's just like a big group and you kind of take things from everybody and you, you know, you might have your few favorites, but it's hard to pick out that sort of 
that one person. But I love that. I think that's that's awesome that it's your dad. There you go. So let's go into the match a little bit. So again, we're down in um, Lee Valley, and so not an unfamiliar place for you and that sort of thing. And we're in the first quarter of GB Germany, and and I liked this clip, and I pulled it out right from the start because you did a little intervention there to get things straight and then this unfolds great britain certainly applying a very high press lovely skill and again there's another little trip but here is the equalizer great britain put pressure on right from the, the outset then a great run from griffiths and then it was all about ansel took the ball to the air took that left and right across his body look at this pass griffiths inside goes to ground sees the ball ansel just takes it up here pops it takes it one way than the other and over the goalkeeper's shoulder what a great bit of control and skill yeah that was that was fantastic we'll, we'll just loop that a little so so you you had a little you know getting the ball placement in order and yeah we're still pretty early in the first quarter and you're seeing gb pressing but how does it feel when you get this 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 is a great way to kick off a game isn't it yeah it's kind of it's kind of one year yeah I wouldn't say dream about. It. I don't think I dream about hockey that much. But uh, <laughs> obviously, you know, see, see, see when see when one happens like that, and it just kind of you can all you, you see it in your own in your own way, and you see it opening up in front of you, and you and you're actually because you want you want a really good game. You just you just you're you're almost willing the guy to. It doesn't matter who it is, and it's not you know. Any any player in the world, you're just going like, go on, go on, yeah, and you know, and just you know, because you think you know, you've it's a great opportunity, you know, you've you've had a great bit of play, you've got the luck of the the bounce, and and you know, you've been lucky that the whoever the umpire is, you know, hasn't just blown his whistle too too quickly and things like that, and everything falls into place, and then you get a wonderful goal, and it's and it, that's the point you think. Yeah, I've done my job here. <laughs> I've done awesome. my job. I've made this game better. Yeah. In, in that moment, uh, obviously you've kind of got to follow it up with uh, not making a, a mess of the rest of it. But of course, uh, it's, it's always nice. It's a, a wee kind of a wee feeling inside that you just think, um, I'm pretty pleased with that. Yeah, absolutely. And I I think what what that brings out for me is that you're and, and and we've touched on this a few times that you're not an analyst you don't like to go back through game footage you don't uh like to prepare you like to really just sort of clear your mind and feel centered and feel clear when you're going into games and things like that but you really are a sports person at heart you you know you play tons of sports you're obviously just a fan of the game and what I like about your what you were talking about with the advantage is that like you just want something good to happen in the game. And for that mm. to be what informs you as you're umpiring, I think is really cool. And I think it's it's something that we can all sort of think more about is that that is our job is trying to get the best hockey, you know, put on display there. That's that's our jam. That's our job. Yeah, it's, you know, ultimately, I, you know, I, I'm watching a game of hockey that I, that I need to dip in and out of occasionally. I, I want to be entertained as well. You know, and if I, if I can help entertain myself, if that's <laughs> the right way of putting it, then <laughs> without sounding too rude, um, you know, why not? Oh, that's awesome. I'm definitely pulling that out as a clip. That's awesome. I want to be entertained. <laughs> so I'm going to do a good job. So this this was a clip that I pulled out um, that actually happened just before that goal. So Germany was still up by one. But I thought it would be interesting to go through this a little bit because this is, this is part of what I do in terms of overanalyzing stuff. And, and you, you had a few thoughts on sort of what happened here and why. So lead, lead us through your thoughts on this particular incident that was, yeah, early in, early in the first quarter as well. Yeah, I mean... I look at this one, and I, I, and 
as much as I don't remember a lot about games, I, I, I do specifically remember this mm. um, because I remember the position I was in and as you can see, I'm kind of over in the corner there. If I was, if I had the opportunity, I might not be there next time round. I would try to have anticipated that a bit more. But you know, would, would I have got to a better position or a a more kind of usable position? Looking at the way the players are kind of coming across here, I think I might have kind of cut myself off. Yeah. Uh, to to me, in my in my mind's eye, as I remember it, it looked to me that the the German player had had actually fallen mm -hmm. um, and fallen onto the back of the Great Britain player. Um, but of course, I, I'm at entirely the other angle from where the camera is. Yeah. Now, looking at it from this angle now, I would say, oh, that's a 10 minute yellow card and and is it inside or is it outside? You, know, you, you could go 50-50, that's probably where I think the contact outside. made outside. So, yeah, um, so really, yeah, you know, from this angle, I would go 10 minute yellow card. But from the angle I was at and thinking about okay. it at the time, I, I still felt the guy had kind of fallen and fallen onto the back of him. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's that's where you've got the feeling where, you know, and, and your, your feeling won't always be right. Um, and I think, you know, looking at it from that angle, I would say, well, I've got that wrong. Mm -hmm. um, so... You know, it, it just it shows the power of, of a different angle. Yes. Um, and you know, you, you could you could look at it and you could say, and some people will absolutely say, well, look at the position he was in, and look at this, and look at that, and you, you simply can't do that. You can only look at what's in front of you, mm -hmm. not you know uh, how cynical it is because of where it is. At the end of the day, it's a you umpire what's in front of you, not what what you think someone was thinking about and this, that, and the next thing. And, and the angle I was at didn't look nearly as bad as yeah. it did from the front angle or the, the sort of the, the TV camera side angle, which is ultimately why I gave the kind of very small whistle Yeah, was because I thought that, that guy's fallen onto the back of him. Um, and obviously from, from the other angle, yeah, it's totally different. So yeah, absolutely. I, yeah. Uh, Nick's just chirping in here that uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure it would change. No, go ahead. Uh -huh. I'm not sure it would change necessarily where I would go because see if you stop it right there. Yeah. Um. Hang on. Wait, can you, if we stop it just where the where the camera kind of pans out, and I know you you you've talked about positioning quite a lot before if i if i get closer to the baseline i would have you know i i, I would have got a worse angle yeah I'd, I'd have been looking straight onto it and through through players so yeah. you know you've got to do a hell of a lot of anticipation to get you know maybe towards the goal post where you might get the best angle looking up through yeah through the D. yeah i think i think uh, that's absolutely where you so, would need to go is you know if you were going to do it differently yeah. that has to be the adjustment and that's one of the things that I, uh -huh. I i coach people through because i mean for me i'm i'm not trying to tell anybody that they have to be in a spot but when they when they feed back and say this didn't work i say okay well what can you dif do differently that might work mm -hmm. and for me the difference yeah. is well the outside angle may not have given you exactly what you needed there but you flip it and you make it a sharper angle inside, maybe that's the angle that gets you there. Yeah. But you're absolutely right. Where mm -hmm. you don't want to yeah. be think, is that, you know, caught right in the train tracks there. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and I think, you know, one, one day you'll see that as a, as a 10 minute yellow card and the, another day you might see it as uh, he's kind of falling onto the back of him. You, you know, if I'm, if I'm right from the angle I'm at, I'm right. If I'm wrong, well, I've made a mistake. And, yeah. you know, there's, you there's not much I can do about it. I can't change it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, as you say, what I would look at is what I could do 
in the future? And, you know, would it even be a case of actually stopping? Maybe mm -hmm. more about the, the dotted line yep. instead of coming in. You get the angle there, but then you sacrifice the ball getting played into the D. Right. And you just have to, you have to weigh that up as to, as to which way you're going to go with it. Yeah. So... Ah, yeah. it's, a, it's a good one because it's it's interesting it's uh and i you know i, I still i still for the life may have it, have it in my mind what i saw mm -hmm. um but it's, it's just fantastic when you 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 know you look at it from the other angle and you think oh my god that's a 10 minute yellow card <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And, and trying I've seen, to. I've seen something totally different. <laughs> yeah. And, but working through that, I think, I mean, this, this is, this is why I do what I do and I love doing it because it's, it is this kind of mental gymnastics and the comparison of the different angles and the, and the whys and stuff. And, and, you know, Rachel brings up a really good point here that there, there can be a better angle, but there's no perfect angle, but there's also just kind of, there's different angles and there's different ways of dealing with it. And I guess, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do when we're out there, regardless of whether we're on a pro league pitch or we're just, you know, we're, we're doing some, some under 16 sevens at home or something like that is that we're trying to give the, the players, we're trying to set up a game that allows them to express their skill and to be safe at the same time. And ultimately, again, you can look back yeah. in hindsight and say, well, the game unfolded really, really well. And there were interesting things, but nothing mm -hmm. kind of went haywire from a management perspective from that so um again it it seems like a little bit of justifying but really if you serve your purpose that's the most important thing and it's just kind of playing with yeah. ideas and yeah looking at different you know alternatives and stuff like that <laughs> and rachel's saying even two umpires may not be yeah. enough yeah I don't think we need that many more of them because yeah. then we just get more opinions and we're never going to be able to figure out who we're going to go yeah. with. So <laughs> I'm not a big uh -huh. fan of that. But it was, um, it, was, it was actually interesting that the only one person said anything to me about okay. that. Yeah. Uh, and it wasn't the guy. It wasn't the guy that got fouled. Right. It was uh, one of the other uh, Great Britain players who ran past and, and had a wee chirp about it. Yeah. Um, but no one else said anything. Yeah. So yeah. that's strange. Yeah. Strange. And, and yeah. And the player perceptions are different too, because they're all at different angles and they're looking at different things and yeah. their priorities are different, but yeah. And, and that's, that's one of those reasons that, again, I think, you know, you've built, uh, your reputation and your culture of trust with all these players. They know you, they, you know, they know that you, you do a great job for them. So they're not going to be as, vociferous and any kind of complaint in that situation and so that's that's a nice yeah. a nice place to be because you have a little bit of flexibility but you have to keep earning that trust all the time too i'm not saying that they just let you off the hook for yeah you know no reason at all yeah um just, just yeah. out of niceness <laughs> and and nick just chiming in here I, I feel we can be really hard on ourselves yes for this or that decision shouldn't be um, and that's okay. We can always reflect. Yeah. And this is, this is all just about growing and figuring out other options. So, um, what was this clip? I can't remember. Oh yeah. I, I liked this one. This again, okay. there wasn't much in. else that happened Shipley. in the rest of that yeah, half. It, it was fine. just like lots of great goals. And then you pop just into the third quarter and things kind of get a little that. He knew as soon as it was unusual. Going, then also knows mm -hmm. And I thought this was a nice example of you having that different angle as well. So there's the initial free hit that comes there off Shipperly's foot. And then he just can't help himself and, and get out of the way. Yeah. And you you banged in the PC upgrade. I don't know if we can even, we can barely even see you. So there you are at that interior angle there. And you're on the baseline in a really powerful spot. And then boom. You just sort of nabbed it. Do you, do you remember that one? Or is this like, <laughs> this is one of your first impressions? Of yeah, I, I mean, yeah, because I've not umpired an awful lot, uh, they, they still stick out a wee bit um, from the games. But yeah, I mean, to me, that's that's your, that's just a, a, an absolute basic. It's a, it's a bread and butter thing for umpires. Yep. Uh, that, that guy, he's an international hockey player. He knows what he's doing. You know he has he has made a kind of effort to to get back and then 
you know, he's, he's not even been close to five metres at any point. So, yeah, d- dead easy. Um, yeah. And, you know, I would never consider a, I would never consider a card there. The, the German player, Toby's got, I mean, he's got about 15 folk to get through before he even gets near the goal. So, you know, the, the, the penalty corner from he's it's just bang on. And, that, and that's yep. what it's there for. Yep, absolutely. No, I like I like that. And that was going to be one of my comments or my questions for you is just, you know, checking in at, at what point would you consider a card for that? Would it be if if perhaps that had been a repeated uh, thing that the, the players are breaking down and trying to stop players from getting to the circle by interfering with the five meters? Is that is that something that you're looking for? Yeah. Yeah, I would I would say it is. And I, I, you, you, again, you get a feeling for a game because you know what might be a what might be a green card and a penalty corner in one game isn't necessarily right for the next game. Mm-hmm. You know, it, 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 the penalty corner can be fine itself, and it's I, I'd hate I hate things that are so prescriptive that you've got to. I know it's strange coming from a policeman. <laughs> Um, but you know, there's, there's, there's a kind of there's there's manoeuvrability and everything. We I get taught this in a driving course. Leave yourself some wiggle room, um, and that's just an opportunity to do something a wee bit different, um, which might just help you further down the line. Right. Uh, in the same way that an early card might help you further down the line in a different game. You know, so you, you take everything on its merit, yep. um, and you know how the how the player reaction is, and all the other everything comes into it, and 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 try and and do the best for for the game itself, yeah. As opposed to hey, if this happens, you must give this, and you know, I, I think yeah, yes, there are situations where if that happens, you must give this. That's absolutely fine, mm-hmm. but there are so many situations where. You know, love a little, just, you know, see see where it goes, you know. And I know that's maybe, a lot of folk maybe look for that certainty to to be able to say, well, right, that's dead easy. If that happens, I'll give this and this. But that's not necessarily right for every game. So, yeah. you know, have a think about it. and yeah. you, You'll not always get it right. But do you know what, see, if you miss a green card, not the end of the world. Yeah. Absolutely. So. No, I like that. Leave yourself some wiggle room. That's something I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm play with a little bit more. Cause obviously I, I, I do a lot of, you know, talking about, you know, Hey, I, 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 I'm trying to encourage umpires to recognize when those interventions need to come. And sometimes it's, it, you know, it's not about always giving the card or giving the big card, or giving that PC upgrade, but sometimes it's just about recognizing what's in front of you but how you intervene can change depending on the feel for the game and, and what the players need from you in order to understand where the line is and what they can't do again and, yeah. you know, what's okay. So, no, that's a, that's, that's a really good point. So when we were talking earlier about your skills in, in policing and, and okay. empathy, oh, this might be the wrong one. Let's go to this one. Went to the sim bin. Is this the VR for management? I think I've skipped some scenes. Oh no, that's not the one I want to show just yet. Let's let's see if this one gives the no. I kn- okay. Okay. Hold the phone. Shipley. Hold the phone, sir. Ooh, Don't panic. Shipley. Yeah, he wasn't five. Because for just some reason the wrong Alka is too smart for that. He knew as soon as it was video going. Video was playing. Then also knows. But I'm just going to change this on the fly because I have that skill. Okay, hang on. Here it is. Okay. Can the shift to it's left. a corner. Picks up. Rebound up. comes out. And we can hear their thing straight up into him. So we see on the replay that we're watching now, he's come down, he's right underneath that wallet. And we can, we can it. hear what the commentators are saying, but you're having an exchange right now with, with Hauka. It's not about whether it's at goal or not. Okay, but if you, yeah, no, no, how you see it. 
Not what you say, but how you say it. Okay. That's fine. I know, I know. And that is why we're having a conversation and nothing more. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, so imagine. And being very clear. Being f for everybody at home, when we're watching this, it's amazing to be able to pick up these exchanges between you and a player. Do you feel self conscious when this kind of stuff is happening? Because you're like, oh my God, this is on audio and everybody's going to hear this. Is that a thing? No, no, <laughs> my mouth runs away with me sometimes when I'm talking to the players. And, and it's because I'm trying to do the stuff about the game and see when you stop for the actual when you get up there and you ask the question it's at that point you start thinking right okay be careful about what you're saying and you know before that it's it's just it's just natural it just kind of you're doing what you need to do for the game so yeah um and what honestly once it goes up the stairs you know i've, I've done my bit i've done as much as i can do um so you know, it's, I, it just happens, you know, it just kind of happens. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so this, I, I don't know, and you don't absolutely don't have to repeat what Halka said to you at this moment, but I mean, obviously you were not happy with the tone of voice that he was using. And what I like is that you, you, you made it very clear what your expectations were, that you were okay, that he was challenging the decision that he wanted a video referral, but it was about the tone that he used and, you know, and you, in this exchange here, you're conveying it very clearly, but you know, you were, you know, your body language is very firm, especially right here at this moment. And, and then you're able to have the little, yeah, you know, hand on the shoulder, your side on with him, your shoulder to shoulder. You're like, Hey, we're on the same side, dude. All right. All right. You know, let's go. And then you take on the situation. So there's a lot of things I, that went into the management there that I really liked. Is any of that conscious for you? Or is that just part of sort of your skill set that you've built up through years of experience umpiring and as well in your police work? Yeah, it's, it's kind of a bit of everything. I, it's, I, I suppose I've maybe been doing it for that long that it's, it's not overly conscious. I mean, I... I don't tend to get, as much as it doesn't come across like that, I don't tend to get angry on the pitch. It's it's that you, you're doing what you need to do to get your message across and, and, and spoken to the way that you feel you should be spoken to. I mean, I've known Toby for, I've umpired him for years and years and years. Uh, and I've got a very, very good relationship with them, both, you know, both on and off the pitch, you know, we chat away and, and that, I, I, you know, I, I think he's a fabulous guy to umpire. Yeah. Um, but he, he, for, you know, I'm not saying he forgets, but, you know, he, sometimes you know, it's this big shouting in your, you know, in your face and, and that's fine for the initial reaction, but when it goes on, and there's a bit more mm -hmm. that's when nah, you've you've had your shot i'm not having that yeah. um so you get in and you you make it very very for me i make it very very clear that's not acceptable we've been through this before you know fine well how you should be speaking to me and then you can start as, as you can see you then start bringing it down a wee bit yeah and that's it you know you, you know you're back because you don't you don't want to be sending him away with a I feel that like I've, you know, I've been given into trouble like a naughty schoolboy. Yeah. You want him to go away thinking, well, he's, I've got my point across. Okay. Maybe I was a bit loud, but I've got my point across and now we can move on. And I'll just, in the back of my mind, I'll just remember not to shout at that Scottish guy. Yeah. Again. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> until, um, until next time. Until next time. Um, Nick just saying a massive thank you. He has to pop off, but he's really enjoying it. So there you go. Thanks very much for that. So this this brings us into the next scenario. We're now just a little bit into Q4. And I think Germany is carrying a green card. It's a little hard to see on the screen. And you have to stop the game and deal with Halka again. So what happened from your perspective on this whole thing? There's Colonel Sanders there talking to you. 
So, too many players on the pitch, hi. so what's happened is that uh, I think it's no, it's not long into the start of the the, the fourth quarter, and they had a, a player off, and I I didn't know. However, I get told so they by the, with 10. the yeah. Hannah, who was the they reserve umpire, with that they had too many players in the pitch. So we obviously have to stop and say, right, okay, that's we need to get this sorted out. And you know, as is the rules, the captain picks up a yellow card for that. Yeah. The problem with this was that that, that Toby started talking about. Uh, he confused me, and I think it was more of a, a bit of a language barrier. Mm. He started talking about having eight players in the pitch, mm -hmm. and I thought, well, why, in, why on earth would you have eight players in the pitch? Right. But I think what he actually meant was eight, eight outfield players and the goalkeeper. Oh, okay. Which would have been nine, which would have been correct. So he was wanting to make sure that when he went off, they had the right number of people, and it didn't happen again. Yeah. So yeah, it's probably. I mean, the kind of. Uh, some folk will maybe say that you know the conversation went on a bit long and yeah it maybe did yeah but i think you know to get that message across is is kind of important as well and obviously there was a wee bit of confusion in there as so um yeah i mean he, he took it pretty well yeah so. absolutely and i i think this is fun because i'm i we don't see on the production because yeah it now flips to halka and he's still not sitting down which again you don't care about because you're worried about what's happening on the field in the big white box, but I'm I'm guessing yeah. that the bully didn't happen unless Germany was really good about just hitting the ball back to GB quickly. It seemed like no, GB bully, just took it happened. and played a free hit, or they did hit it back to them. Yeah, no, they did hit it back. Oh, yeah. okay. That uh, okay. happened so. No, it just happened really quickly. Yeah. Okay, there you go. Well, that's that's good to know. Um, yeah. So. But what I liked about this whole thing, and we've we've gone to the back to the beginning of it again, is that your body language and the way that you talked to Hauka, who you had just kind of had a bit of a, you know, a, a big confrontation with just in the previous quarter, you're just very, you know, you're very factual about it, very calm and just, you know, you can sort of see with your your facial expressions, your eyebrows are you're like, hey, this is how it's gonna go. You bring out the yellow and it's it's not like a bang it's just a yeah you know this this is what we got to do you shrug your shoulders a little bit and so I felt like this was a really nice sort of separation and a de-escalation from what could have been confrontational because Hauka's not happy obviously he's he's played a huge part in this match because of you know not only just being the captain but because of the crew that had been brought on this game He'd been running the show for the whole game, and now he's got to sit out for a crucial five minutes in the in the fifth quarter. But it doesn't seem like there's, you know, he didn't get angry back at you, which I thought was was very skillful on your part. And again, you know, you're just like, hey, just off you go, and and trying to keep things nice and calm, you know, which was good. And then you count. <laughs> yeah. I said, I I think I, th I know her. I, I think that this is one of these ones where you you can you can almost afford to to be apologetic in in the the card that you're given. Yeah, yeah. There's been a there's been a mess made. However, you know, yeah, and you, yeah, very much. So you kind of shrug your shoulders and say, "Look, I'm really sorry, but this is one of these this is one of these times where you had too many players on the pitch." I have to give you a yellow card. Yeah, I'm really sorry, but that's just that's just the way it is. And I think if you, it, it's good because if you can, you know, if you if you can communicate that to them, then you know you're not getting it. See, if if you if you start getting, you know, all all highly strung about it and and march over and say this and that, you know, that's going to annoy people especially in a situation where you, you simply have to give something, there's nothing else you can do. You might as well be a bit sympathetic about it. You yeah. know, it's, it's just one of those things. Terribly yeah. sorry. I, and it's not, it's not Hauke's fault. You know, it's, it's, you know, he just happens to be the captain and, and that's, you know, that's the way it is for the captain sometimes. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. And it's, and and, uh, that's one of the things that I like about international hockey that and not having to stop my watch. I absolutely, I am so bad at keeping time that any time I can blame a table and just be like, Hey, you guys, you guys get to do all the timing stuff. I don't even have to keep score. It's so (laughs) great. But yeah, it's, it's something that was outside of your control. You're not monitoring the players coming in and out. You're, it's just, you're just focused on what's happening there and you're taking the message that you were getting. And so it was, so Hannah Harrison was the reserve umpire there and she was the one who, who got in your ear, you know, at that, at that moment and said, Hey, we got to stop the game right now because they had too many players. And given that Germany was, um, was, was serving, was supposed to be serving a green card as well. That was, that was a pretty big deal. So yeah, I, uh, (laughs) <laughs> I really like that. So just one last clip that happened um, right near okay. the end of the game. Now he's dropped and back. you're probably going to give me the whole dead easy line, line about this. And Waller with the tackle on Rod Lander. And this, this reminded me of the danger call yeah. and many other ones that you're, well, you're not, really, you're not really thinking about this. Front running. It came really quickly for you. Line running. Stopping I'm time to give the card on here. You gave you all a card to anyway, to Waller on this tackle. The power of the run. Rotland are driving through there. Yeah, take stop. No, they haven't going to go upstairs. Waller's going to make his way to the bench. He'll take no further part in this uh, contest. And there was a little bit of conversation because Dixon was there too that they might have gone to referral. And so, did you say anything to talk them out of that? How do you handle that when the players are coming to you and they're they're really going to lose that referral. <laughs> and it's a bad one because you are, you've given a card. And so even if you got overturned, mm-hmm. that card stays for now. Like that's the way that the regulations have addressed or not addressed carding situations. Cards can't be appealed on review. So yeah. how, how did you, how do you sort of talk to the players there to, kind of get them to see sense as it were in this situation it, it's it, it's really not my job to to talk someone out of 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 taking the referral Fair. um yeah. I, I i'm very wary about saying anything to players you know i'll say to them look you have your referral you can take it if you want that's entirely your right um there's even if it's I, I would only say to a player you know something along the lines of that's not referable mm. um if they want to take their referral yep it's all yours to take guys it's you know it's it's none of my business I, you know i would be looking at that even you know as any of their other players would look at that you know they're, they're never going to win that referral yep. um, it's never going to be upheld um, and, you know, I thought they might have taken it just because of the time that was left, right. uh, which wouldn't have surprised me. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, in terms of, in terms of what we do is a, the, the video referral is a process and it's a process out with what it's out with our, our control when they decide that, you know, when they give that T sign. You just stop the game and just say, "Okay, what's what, what are you want to refer," mm-hmm. and, and and just let them get on with the process. Um, I, as much as I'm all for helping players through the game, that that, that point you're on your own. If you yeah. want to take your referral, you take your referral, and don't don't come asking me for what have you given that for, because that's you trying to elicit you know, information that will, will, you know, you've given me the T sign, you know, it's different if a player asks, what, what have you given that for? I'll tell them. Yeah. See if you're saying, no, we want to, we want to go to video and then you say, what did you give it for, by the way? Just right. so they can, that, that, that's, that's trying to, that's trying to cheat the system. Yeah. And, and I don't, well, cheats, cheats, a strong, cheats a stronger word than, a, than I mean, but yeah. that's, that's trying to gain information that, you know, you're, you know you're you're not entitled to you've decided to take your referral take your referral yeah and it's um, not it, it's not super not impactful anyway because of the way that the regulations 
are phrased at the moment. And I understand that this is a topic of conversation um, at the top about whether the grounds of the referral matter. So, um, you know, they, 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 as you've experienced, we've gone back and forth on this, whether what they ask for matters or, you know, can they ask for a penalty corner or say you've awarded a penalty corner and then they ask for a penalty stroke. If they don't earn that upgrade through the video referral process, should they lose their challenge, their right to refer in the future of the game? Mm. Or if you've given it for a foot, it turns out there wasn't a foot, but there was actually a stick obstruction that just happened within the same couple seconds in that passage of play. So actually a penalty corner was still the correct decision. Should they also refer? lose the referral, even though they were right that there wasn't a foot. So it's like these technicalities that are all raising their heads and, and, you know, boggling your brain. I can totally understand why it is that your, your approach as the pitch umpire has to be very hands off and to say, well, you ask your question and it's going to be for the video umpire to, to deal with all those sort Mm -hmm. of technicalities. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I, I think the the video referral isn't perfect because there's so many bits to it. Uh and, and I don't think there's there, there's no perfect answer yeah. to it. It's it's probably just about getting as best you can for as many circumstances and sets of situations as possible. Yeah. Is there a possibility that you know you just say we we want to we want a referral and you review the last passage of play and yep. you know the you make a decision as to which you know if there's the first foul that you see goes up i don't know i mean i don't know what the because every time you think it's running really well you get that one wee uh something that falls into the other category and it just says oh, that's that we're not we're not quite getting that bit right and so always it's always probably going to need tinkered with Yes, but I, th- I think generally, you know, it, it, it's it's a very the, the video stuff is very very positive. Yeah, but we we have to realise that we're never going to perfect it because how do you perfect something that's got so many variables? Yeah, um, and it's just probably about getting the right thing. And you know, if, every time we've had something, you know, at least you know that's been looked at each time and, and is reviewed regularly. Um, and I think kind of football are now starting to realise that just because you've got VAR doesn't mean to say it's going to be perfect right at the start. And they're now starting to look at it and and kind of tinker with it a wee bit and think, well, how does this work for our sport and what are the implications yeah. of this, that, and the next thing? And and you know they'll get there because I, I well you'll remember when it kind of first came in and I remember when it first came in and everyone thought some people thought this is brilliant some people thought oh my god this is terrible mm-hmm. um, and it, you know they took it really personally thinking oh they're proving me wrong yeah and, you know it's, it's not about that it's just yeah. trying to get the best the best for the, the players and the teams and and yeah. ultimately yourself as well so yeah. it's just kind of an art tool absolutely yeah no i i agree i think i think we've generally got a, a pretty good system uh given how long it's been in place and and like you said, all the variables that are involved, it's incredibly complex. And the fact that we have a fairly decent system in place that really does get to the right result in many cases, I think it's, it's, a you know, it's definitely a, a privilege to have. And it's, it's one of those things that, you know, for all of us at home, um, we like, it's so intriguing. Like we want to talk about it all the time, even though it's something that for us, we're probably mm. not going to get to experience. <laughs> very much even i i only had two matches where video umpiring was involved and once when i was on the pitch and then i was in the booth and and that was it <laughs> and then that, that was the end of my video umpiring career so um but i th- i think what it's it's interesting is that it points out the ways in which decision making is a very complicated thing and at the end of the day, it's about serving the sport and, and just trying to get closer to that ideal, but we're never going to get there at the same time. Yeah. So, yeah, I love that. Well, it's been 
uh, it's been over a keely hours. They like to say, I like to take, uh, to say that we're going to be on for night for 60 minutes and then we're on for 90 and that's a keely hour, but, uh, we're even a little bit over that, but I, I'm just so appreciative of the time that you've given. And I know that you're, are you back on night shift this week or did you, did you switch back? I can't remember. No, I'm early shifts, early shifts. So I start at uh, six o'clock tomorrow morning. Oh, goodness. Okay. Well, it is probably past your bedtime, yeah. sir. So I thank you for staying up and talking to us. It was really great to get to know you and to, you know, be able to work through the clips and things like that. And I thought you were thoroughly understandable. Yeah. I don't know what this bullshit is about that your, your <laughs> accent is very understandable to me, but what? It just, it just Do must you want me be. to tell you a quick story before I go about my accent? Yes, please. So I was uh, I was umpiring uh, the Euro League. I think it was the final, and it was between Orange Park and uh, I'd like to say a German club, but I can't remember exactly who it was. Okay. But I had to call both the uh, captains over, and uh, Rob Vanderhorst was the the Orange Park captain, and I said, you know, I've spoken to you guys. I've already given you a warning. This isn't this isn't acceptable. And he turned around to me and said, "Maybe you should have said it in English." <laughs> oh my so god! So yeah, cheeky smell. So that was a, that was a, an entertaining <laughs> moment. So, <laughs> oh, the charm that is awesome i love that story yeah <laughs> that's when you know that you've got a good relationship with the players when they can crack that kind of quality joke at you yeah. that's good banter i love it yeah and get away with it. Yeah, exactly so good, good fun well thank you so much and you know i'm gonna miss seeing you out on the pitch for euros it's it, i was really looking forward to to that yeah. i you know obviously since i picked you as my favorite male umpire on the dream team and then now you're not going to be out there but i am looking forward to seeing you in tokyo and fingers crossed everything goes well for that so all the best for that preparation and we're very appreciative to have had you on umpire at home so thank you very much thank you very much you bet and thanks everybody at home for all the questions and the inquiries and all that kind of stuff it was great to have you along And we will see you next week at some point during the Euros. Make sure you go buy a subscription, go support the hockey, and we'll see you there. Bye, everybody.